Hallelujah. Shabbat shalom. It's good to see everyone this morning. It's nice having the windows open, isn't it? I love it. <laughs> Let me just tell you. Yeah, I'm a window open guy. A lot of you don't know, I'm going to reveal a secret of the Lindstroms. <laughs> that was precious. <laughs> Linda loves the outdoors so much, she still dries her clothes outside. She hangs them up. That's right. That's right. Am I right? That's right. There's just something about the outdoors. Amen? The little secrets I know about everyone. <laughs> Maybe I broke a pastoral confidentiality there. You're going to have to pray for me. I don't know. Darn it, it wasn't intentional. Judge me by my spirit. <laughs> you know, for many of you, uh, in fact, speaking of Linda, she used to lead a choir in a, a previous church, right? When you were, she was in a Nazarene church, she, they had a, a, a lot of churches have choirs, big you know, choirs, you know. And, uh, you know, there's a story about a, a church who had a choir loft, but typically they're like above the platform, but in the, this case of this church, it sat below eye level of the congregation. It's kind of like in an orchestra pit kind of situation there. And, and they had kind of this sort of low velvet curtain kind of across the front of it. And several of the more creative choir members, this was particular choir was a rather large choir, and several of the more creative members discovered that during the intervals uh, in the worship service, when the pastor was getting a little long and winded, not that it ever happens here, thank goodness, but, but before they could uh, draw on their, they figured out that they could crawl, I should say, on their hands and knees behind this little curtain railing, and they could exit through the side door, and right next door was a Starbucks. So they could kind of sneak out the side door, get a little Starbucks, and make it back in time to not ever be noticed missing. On one particular Sunday, uh, making his escape for his Sunday coffee, a gentleman on his return trip didn't notice, but like halfway across uh, his little journey back to his uh, place in the choir, that there was laughter that was spreading through the congregation and he wasn't really sure what that was all about. And then it, it occurred to him, he was on the wrong side of the railing. <laughs> now, why the story is you know, kind of funny at first, if you think about it, it's actually kind of tragic. It's, it's pretty darn tragic. But I'll just say this as I get into my drosh this morning. The God that we worship is able to see on both sides of the curtain. Could it be, could it be God's people in many congregations, and I, you know, we know that there are all kinds of congregations. There's mainline congregations, there are evangelical congregations, that seems to be a catch-all today. There are independent congregations, there are charismatic congregations, there are messianic congregations. Is it, can we, could it be that these, all these congregations combined have perhaps lost a sense of reverence. Lost a sense of reverence that ought to characterize those who gather in the holy presence of a living God. See, in most congregations, it's fair to say the fellowship is hospitable and the Bible teaching is, is, is faithful, it's you know, deliberate and good. But each week, the people file in and out with the label the worship service without ever really, sadly, coming close to sensing the holy presence of our God. Now, it's easy to fall into the, into the, uh, the disease of playing church or going through the motions of worship without ever really encountering God. Where modern worship has evolved into performance and entertainment, I believe our portions this morning are declaring to us that worship, worship should be a reverent response to God's holy presence. And I know there's a lot of people that would amen that big time. 
I know there's a lot of amens in the spirits of a lot of you people here today that our worship should be a reverent response to God's holy presence. Specifically from this Shabbat's Haftarah portion, this is the main reason, or main lesson, I should say, from David's bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. David had been, a, you know, he came for about seven years now at this, at this time in the, the uh, Shmuel, Aleph, or actually Beit, and, or actually Aleph and Beit. And the kingdom, which at first was divided, has now been consolidated under David's rule. And he desired to make the worship of God central to the national life of Israel. And to do this, his plan was to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And the first revelation we can draw from this account of him doing this is this, that God's holy presence should be the focus of true corporate worship. God, brothers and sisters, and I know I'm preaching, pardon me, to the choir, but God is omnipresent and omniscient, but he's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. But his presence, and this is the point, is not often realized everywhere. Just because he's there doesn't mean that we're always catching it. When I talk about the presence of God, I mean his realized presence. When God's people come together for worship, we ought to focus on his holy presence. And that's what the ark symbolized for B'nai Israel. The ark was, many of you have read in the scripture, it was a rectangular box. It was about three and three quarters feet long by two and a quarter feet wide by two and a quarter feet high. It contained the ten words of the Ten Commandments. And in earlier days, at least, Aharon's rod, which budded, and of course, the pot of manna, or manhu. It was made of wood. It was overlaid with gold. And the top of the ark was a mercy seat, a solid slab of gold in which the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, sprinkled the blood of the sacrificial lamb upon once a year on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And the ark was kept in the Holy of Holies and was always kept covered when being moved on a journey. The ark was a symbol, was a symbol of God's meeting with his people on the basis of atonement. The Lord told Moshe, there I will meet with you. There I will meet with you. That's an important appointment. When the creator of all that exists says, there I will meet with you. Now we get our choice as free will to be just about anywhere we want, brother, right? I think my first choice is when the creator of the universe says, I'm going to meet you here, I ain't going to be late. <laughs> I'm going to be there. I'm going to be there. It represented God's, the our tangible presence, not unlike Messiah Yeshua. The materials of the ark, gold and wood, typified the person of Yeshua as both God and man. The function of the ark as the mercy seat typified the work of Yeshua as the sacrificial lamb of God. And when we gather, brothers and sisters, as God's people, we gather unto Messiah Yeshua who is in our midst. He promised it. He promised when two or three, three five, six, 30, 40, he's here. <laughs> he's here. And it's because of his person, God in human flesh, and his work as the satisfaction of the divine penalty for our sins that we could draw near unto God. God's holy presence is an awesome thing. I think the word today is epic now. The ark is described here in our Haftar portion as... The ark of God, which bears the name, the name of Adonai Sabaot, enthroned above the Kerevim. And the Kerevim are angels 
that dwell in the presence of Almighty God. They are awesome in their appearance, indescribable. Being associated in Scripture with fire and lightning in the blinding brightness of the glory of God. Sometimes I wonder in our fascination, we're getting into that season with thunder and lightning as the seasons change. Sometimes I'll just stand there and just behold the lightning. And I wonder, why is that? Am I so attracted to that? Why do I want to watch that? Maybe that's what it is. Maybe, maybe in my spirit I know it's like, I'm not unlike the angels of God that are surrounding him. Maybe. Two golden kerubim with their wings touching and overshadowed the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. The only human eyes could ever view that sight were those of the Kohen Agadol and only once a year in Yom Kippur. Now, as David and the people worshipped before the Ark, it's clear that they were worshipping in the presence of or before Adonai. And as we'll see, even though they had this sense of God's presence they were too careless, too careless about it at first. And because of their carelessness, it bore tragic consequences. But God made it explicitly clear that to worship in his presence is an awesome thing. Not to be taking or take in lightly. You know, we live in a day... That In our passion to reach the world, we live in a day of very flippant Christianity. Flippant worship of God that has brought God down to the level of our good buddy in the sky. Where we've lost the proper sense of awe and fear of his holy presence. Some of you know who John MacArthur is. I had the blessing to meet him when I was in Southern California. Quite a character. But a very, very strong man of the word, though I disagree theologically with some things. Of course, he probably disagrees with me quite a bit. But, but he's, he's an incredible man. And he tells a story about a, a pastor friend of his that Jesus often appears to him while he's shaving. All right. And Mr. MacArthur's, Pastor MacArthur's response was, well, uh, and you kept shaving? <laughs> you know. Continues MacArthur, I am certain. I am certain that if the people today who claim to have seen God really saw him, they wouldn't be lining up to get on the latest Christian talk show They'd be lying prostrate on the ground, grieving over their sin. Brothers and sisters, as we gather to worship, it would transform us in our worship if we could just focus on the truth that you are assembling and gathering and worshiping in the holy presence of God rather than be so transfixed by the presence of your brothers and sisters. We should not come primarily to meet our friends. Although fellowship is an important function of any kehilat, and we excel at it, praise the Lord. That's why a lot of you are here, because of good relationships that you have developed over the years. Good people here. And good people have relationship with. Real people really love the Lord. That's a good thing. Gracious people. Sacrificial people. And that's a good reason to be part of a congregation. But that's secondary. That's secondary in why we should be here. We should come primarily for one reason, one reason alone primarily, and that's to meet with God. True corporate worship involves focusing on the fact that the Holy God is here. And that means that not only focusing on his presence, 
but revering it. Revering it. Reverence in God's presence should be our response in true corporate worship. You know, since the ark was the visible symbol at that time of the presence of God in the midst of B'nai Israel, you would think, you would think that there would have been a uniform response of reverence on the part of all who were in the presence of the ark. But if you go back 75 years to the, from that moment and trace the history of the ark, Scripture reveals in the travels of the ark quite different and instructive responses to its presence. It's very interesting how various individuals responded to the presence of the ark. Let's begin with just Israel as a whole. B'nai Israel, the ark, sadly, was treated as a good luck charm. Was treated as a good luck charm. See, at that time in Israel's history, the worship of God was yeah, pretty much a dead ritual. And if you want to get a sense of what that's like, show up in most synagogues. There's some really cool cultural stuff there. Well, you can't tell me you feel the power and the presence and the moving of the Holy Spirit. Of course not. It's ritual. It's ritual. Two priestly sons of Eli or Eli, they were corrupt. <laughs> the priest's sons were corrupt. And they were doing a little more than sneaking off to Starbucks. You know what they were doing during the service? Maybe you read your Bible? Yeah, it's right around the corner from the uh, door of the tent of meeting. They were engaged in, shall we say, sexual conduct. Yeah, that's what the priest's sons were doing. The consequence, when Israel went out to fight against the Plishtim and the Philistines, what do you think happened? They were beaten severely. So instead of humbling themselves before the Lord, someone gets the idea, hey, let's uncover the ark, let's you know, break it out of storage, <laughs> and let's, uh, let's bring it into the battle. That will be our good luck charm. Well, since God sees both sides of the railing, he recognized their spirits, therefore allowing them to be defeated again. And allowing the ark, not only for the people to be de defeated, but allow the ark to be captured by the Palestine. It was bad and it got worse because he didn't learn from the first time. May that be a lesson to all of us. You don't learn the first lesson. It'll get worse the second time and even worse the third time. So you can keep playing with sin, but it's going to bite you badly each and every time you continue in it. Now, there are churchgoers who attempt to use their attendance to services as a kind of good luck charm. Um, I did my godly duty. I've shown up on Shabbat. <laughs> that should buy me a little favor for the week, at least. The good luck charm. They're having problems in their lives. And that's a good reason to come back to fellowship with the Lord. There's nothing wrong with that. That's where you should go. You should go and find direction and encouragement and hope from the Lord. So I think, but their attitude is what, what God takes a look at. They think, well, if I go to church and hang out for a couple hours with God, maybe he'll uh, fix my problems doesn't work that way. But for them, worship is nothing more than a good luck charm to try to get God in their side. They know little to nothing of God's holy presence. Now that they had the ark, 
The second group was B'nai Israel. Well, the second group now that had the ark is what? The Philistines, the Plishtim. Now they've got the ark. But it was interesting. The Plishtim used it as an attempt to worship two gods at once. Their god Dagon and the god of Israel. I don't think anybody does that these days, do they? Well, we know this never works out. Because our God is a jealous God. He don't share. He's like an only child. I don't share. I had to learn it. But I don't share my wife. I don't know caused their idol to fall down and to break into pieces and then afflicted them with plagues of tumors and mice. And many have tried doing the same, attempting to worship the God of the world alongside the God of the Word. And this insincere attempt at trying God. Have you heard that before? I'm going to try God. And this insincere attempt at doing so most always will fail. And you'll see that in your own congregation here. People who haven't worshipped the Lord, they'll come check it out a couple times. And then they'll get heat from family and friends and there are all kinds of problems in life. And oh, this trying God thing's not working out. It didn't fix all my problems. And they go back to what's familiar. You go back to what was. Trying God. And as you can imagine, the blitz team... Wanted to get rid of the ark pretty fast. <laughs> Let's get rid of this puppy. They were quite uncomfortable with the presence of God. And even so, there are some who feel a plague of guilt when they come near a congregation where God's presence is known. And even more uncomfortable when they come in the presence of somebody who really knows what it is to be in the presence of a holy God. They are uncomfortable with you because of that. Their spirits, it's like water and oil. This is your spirits have been given over to the presence of God. They don't feel really good getting close to you. And that's a good thing. Because we are to make them uncomfortable. We are too. And then there's Avinadav. His response is the whatever. <laughs> you know, it's the word for today. It's the whatever. Don't judge me. Whatever. It's the whatever response to the presence of God. The Plushim, they had sent the ark back to Israel on a cart and then wound up in the house of Avinadav. And there it stayed for how long? Oh, about 70 years. 70 years. And it is significant that we do not read of any results in Avinadav's household for having the ark there all those years. The same feeling many of you have in your own homes when you wonder why your children aren't feeling the same holy presence of God that you do, and they're not getting it. What's going on? What's going on? 70 years. Now, we'll see in a moment what took place in Oved Edom's house after just three months with the ark. Seventy years of Vinadav's house, and nothing happened. Some believers are like that. They attend a congregation for years where God is present, but it has no appreciable effect on their lives. Dude, what's the gold box on your mantle? <laughs> oh, it's the ark of the covenant. Pretty cool, isn't it? You can be in the very presence of God and be oblivious to it if your heart doesn't seek after him. And then there's Uzzah. There's Uzzah. He's not much different than Avinadav. He's more like uh, chill. It's chill, dude. You get a little too jacked up here. Because that's what Uzzah might have said if he had lived in our day. And he had lived to say anything. As David and company moved the ark towards Jerusalem on an ox cart, 
You know the story, the oxen stumbled, and the ark starts to tip and almost falls in the dirt. You know what it does, right? He, uh, he reaches out, and he tries to steady it, touches it, and God struck him dead on the spot. Now, some folks think, I mean, that's a little touchy <laughs> on God's part. I mean, that's a really a harsh response. I mean, he's just trying to, you know, trying to keep it from falling over. What's the big deal, God? Any wagon driver would have done the same. And would have done the same with anything that's valuable and precious. But see, that's precisely Uzzah's problem, you know, catching it. The problem is he didn't see any difference between something valuable in this world and something valuable of God. The two are not the same. That's where we've lost it in the body of Messiah. The two aren't the same. It's not. What's precious in the world is not the same preciousness of God. It's not the same. He was overly familiar with that which was utterly sacred. Uzzah was the son or grandson of Avinadav. I'm not sure. He had grown up with the ark in his home. And what had happened? The ark, he knew it all his life. It was common to him. Like those of you who have grown up in the church, <laughs> it was common to you. Talk to somebody who's been born again and saved in mid or later life. It's a little different. It's a little different. Your faith, your walk, your trip to, to Sunday church, your Christmas services, all the things that you did growing up, it was common. It's what you did. You were Christians. It's what your parents did. It's your family did. It's how you identify. If you're Italian, you're Catholic. It's what you do. If you're Greek, you go to the Romanian, or if you're Romanian, you go to the Romanian church. If you're Greek, you go to the Greek Orthodox church. It's what you do. It's for your culture. If you're Jewish, you go to the synagogue. I don't know, maybe it's Orthodox, maybe it's Reformed, maybe it's conservative, but you go to synagogue. It's what you do. It's common to you. But he should have known. He should have known that either Levitical priest who carried the ark were not permitted to touch it, but carried it on poles inserted through the rings attached to it. Some in our day, often there are people who have grown up, as I said, we, we, get, we trifle with the things of God. And that which is utterly sacred becomes just, like I said, very common to us. Those who have a problem with what God did to Uzzah need to gain the Bible's perspective on God's absolute holiness and man's utter sinfulness. There is a difference. That, that sort of those, that, that valley is shrinking where we less and less are we're having much more trouble distinguishing between what is holy from God and what is sinful of the world. It's hard to tell so much. It's not quite as distinct of a divide anymore. We need to take God's presence very, very serious. And then, of course, it takes us to King David. King David. Now, he's angry. He's an angry guy. He's an intense, angry guy. He's angry at God. See, David got angry at God, and then he grew afraid. And It wasn't a healthy fear of the Lord, but an unhealthy fear that caused him to draw back and ask, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? And there was some pride behind David's anger. He was embarrassed in front of the crowd. God had not done things David's way. God had rained on David's parade, but the problem wasn't that God hadn't done things David's way, but that David hadn't done things God's way. What? <laughs> he didn't do things God's way? Who does that? God's word is clear. It's not complicated, even for somebody as simple as me, that the ark had to be carried by the Levite, the Levites in a prescribed way. Remember, 
when I taught you about the tabernacle or the Mishkan, it was the first time in history of humanity that they did things God's way. It never happened. <laughs> and that's the story of the ark, carrying it in a prescribed way on their shoulders without touching it, not on an ox cart. And where did they get the idea of the ox cart? Where do you think they got it? From the world, from the plasteam. Worked in the world, should it work for God? That's what's happening in the church today, isn't it? Believe me, I was under the tutelage of those who wrote books on that matter. The per, uh, uh, George Barna and Company. If it works in the world, you should treat the church just like you would a business. More and more, as the unholiness of this world seems to find its way into our worship, we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be surprised at the lack of blessing and genuine presence from a holy God. There are folks who think that they want God's presence, but they don't understand God's holiness, or they play loose with God's truth. When things don't go the way they want it, they get angry, and they blame God just like David did. But if our circumstances haven't changed much in the past year, look back. Has your circumstances changed much in the past one year? How about two years? How about three years? How about four years? If your circumstances haven't changed, perhaps, just a wacky idea, but perhaps we ought to get on our faces and figure out why. Why God's blessing is not upon our life. Maybe there's a very simple answer that we're refusing to humble ourselves to hear. Well, let's not stop with David. He was equally yoked. To who? Michael. His wife, Michael. And it was David's wife, Michael, and her response to the ark that triggered this drosh. When I read that, I go, OMG. Michael. It was as if she was jealous of God. See, as you know, as I said, she was David's wife, but in 2 Samuel 6.16 and verse 20, the scripture identifies her not so much as David's wife, but as the daughter of Shaul or Saul. And that's intentional, because we had to know what her family lineage was all about. It helped us identify where she was coming from in her own nature and spirit. Notice her relationship to the worship celebration. She was a spectator. And so the obvious question Considering whom her husband was, why wasn't she a participant? Why wasn't she a participant? She should have been down in the streets alongside her husband, rejoicing and celebrating with him. Why wasn't she? Why wasn't she? No, she remained at a distance, peeking out, bothered by David's passion for the presence of God. Michael loved David the warrior. She was all about David the warrior, but she couldn't relate to David the worshiper. She couldn't connect with that part of him. How often are we in love with aspects or qualities of our spouse and not the individual as a whole? She was critical of David's passion and love of God. And I see it in so many marriages. In 20 some years of doing this, I see this in so many marriages. One or the other spouse critical of the other because of their passion and commitment and devotion to God. And it becomes a house divided. And it's sad. She was critical of his love for God. David's first love was God. David's first love was God, which for Michael wasn't something her pride would allow her to accept. 
Michael was not willing to humble herself, and so the Lord humbled her. <laughs> humbled her with the ultimate disgrace in that society, and what was that? Barrenness. Barrenness. You know, it's interesting, the critics of true worshipers are always proud spectators. Not humble participants. Their narcissism, their narcissism prevents them from being a participant in worship when their spirit demands attention and worship for them. Their concern is focused on what others may think more so than concerned about what God thinks. And that was Michael. And finally, Oved Edom, or Oved Edom, he delighted in God. He delighted in God. Now, we don't, I don't know who this guy was, quite frankly. Not really sure. He was probably a Levite who lived nearby. But he had no problem, no reluctance to bring the ark to his house right after Uzzah was struck dead for touching it. Yeah, I'll take it. Bring it here. Most people go, oh, no. <laughs> I can get near that thing. I saw what it did to Uzzah. I don't want any part of it. But not Evid. Edom, no. Oved Edom was uh, saying, hey, bring it right here. That's amazing. Put it over there. Put it right in the center of my room. For all to see, here's a man whose heart was right before God. Unlike Michael, the presence of God was not a threat to him. It was a delight. He was totally comfortable living with God in the midst of his home. So the father blessed this man in his household, the scripture tells us in verse 11. David heard about it, got his heart right with the Lord. See that? His witness, his passion for God and the favor that God showed him became a witness to David, the great leader, the man after God's own heart, got his heart transformed because of the witness of a brother who embraced the presence of the Lord, celebrated it in his home. But Oved Edom had something to teach David, and he has something to teach us, that he wants the presence of God. He wants the presence of God. Now, how would you feel? How would you feel if, like what happened with Ananias and Sapphira, somebody here was struck dead for something trifling with God, and Yeshua appeared bodily and said, I'd like to come live in your home <laughs> for three months. Would you welcome him? Or would you be a little nervous? The Holy Spirit will reveal the answer to that question. If you revere God in your personal devotions and in your corporate worship, you'd be delighted. You would be delighted thrilled at any prospect of the presence of God as Ovid Edom was. And I'm going to start wrapping this up by asking this question. How could it be that the same ark could be one man's delight and another man's death? How could the same ark be one man's pleasure and another man's plague? How could the same ark result in seven different responses? The difference must not lie with the ark of God's presence, but with the hearts of the people who were in contact with the ark. It is so. If that is so, I should say, where is where's our heart at? Where's our heart? So let me ask you, why do you come to Shabbat? I've asked that many times. Why? Do you come on Shabbat expecting to meet with God? Now, the one way to answer that question is for me to do the Jewish thing. And the Jewish thing is to ask another question. 
in answering that question, how carefully do you prepare your heart for this morning's meeting? How carefully did you prepare? How carefully did you prepare to be here? If you were granted, got a letter. I said, listen, President Trump wants to meet with you down in Mar-a-Lago. He's thankful for your support through his presidency, and he just wants to show you his gratitude and appreciation by having dinner with you. I'm going to fly you down. I'm going to spend a couple of days at his resort, fly you back. What do you think about that? Would you prepare yourself in any way for that? If you say no, you're liars. <laughs> you are liars. Because you would go through some degree of preparation for that trip. Some of you might not be a fan of his. <laughs> you might not do anything. I get it. But generally, if you take away, if you have an animosity towards the former president, I'll pick anybody that is deemed important and significant to you. And if you had the opportunity to meet with them, have dinner with them, would you get prepared for that moment? Or would you just show up after work? Or after working in the yard? Right, would you yesterday after working in the yard go, oh, I got a few minutes to meet with the president. Right. Yeah. Not in a million years. Preparation. If you're going to meet with the holy God, if you really come here to be in the holy presence of Adonai Sevaot, if you definitely come here to be in, in the audience of a holy God, should you not at least spend a few minutes beforehand preparing your heart? The answer to that question for each of us can be found in how we prepare for Shabbat. Now, I've lived in Jewish communities, and I've been a witness to the various degrees of orthodoxy and how they prepare for Shabbat. So we'll just eliminate Reformed. <laughs> but, but we'll deal with conservative and orthodox and ultra-orthodox and neo-orthodox and Reformed and or no, Reconstructionist or whatever, or whatever version they want, but... I've seen it. I've witnessed it. I know how Jews prepare for Shabbat. How prepared are you every Shabbat morning to come meet the most powerful presence in creation? Obviously, the president would impress you. How about Yeshua HaMashiach? Does he impress you? Does he impress you? How prepared are you to meet him every Shabbat? How significant is that to you, to be in his presence? If you haven't noticed, you see that up there? You know what that is? You see that in the corner there? That's a cell phone. You know what that is? That's a security camera. Yeah, it's a security camera. We have one uh, here. Uh, there's one in the parking lot. There, there's one in the Nash Hall. Yeah, Nash Hall. Now, every time when this building is empty, well, at least I think it's empty, I get this little notice that there's movement. It picks up traces of anybody who is entering the building. <laughs> and it creeps and it creeps out. They were talking about today. It, it kind of creeps them out to think, oh, my gosh. Then every time we come in this building, Rabbi knows it. Rabbi knows it. Sure, I watch you. Right here. I can just watch you. Right here. Sometimes they'll go up to the camera. They'll go, are you watching me? <laughs> See the Torah? See the Torah? It's right here. You see it every Shabbat. It's right in the center of the platform, isn't it? Isn't it? We look at the Torah. It's the word of God, the symbol of our faith, presence of God. We watch it. I want to do something to you now. Now, as you're looking at it, let's reverse things. What if it's looking at you? 
just like that camera, just like the rabbi might be looking at you. What about the rabbi looking at you? Does that change things for you a little bit? When you look at the Torah, you're looking at it. It's only one directional. Well, maybe it's two-way. Maybe you're being looked at. Do you ever think about that? What do you think our Messiah is seeing? What is he seeing from your worship and presence? What, what is he witnessing in your movement? What is, he, what is he noticing about your worship and praise? Would it affect you in any way in how you conduct yourself during a service? Would it have any effect on your worship? Would you sing any differently if the master is watching through that Torah? Would, it be more, would you be more attentive to his word being declared if if he was in the chair next to you, would you dance differently or not dance? But he's present, of course. And the question is, are you aware of his presence? Do you come expecting him to be here present, expecting to meet with him as we gather in his name? Do you go through the list of various responses to God's presence in the ark? Go through it. I just listed seven of them for you. I listed seven responses to just the ark. Just the ark. It would, being here would be like a good luck charm for you, like it was for Israel. Is being here would be like the plishtims who try to balance your praise of God, of the word, with the God of the world. Or you, it would be like Avinadav. This is just another Shabbat. It would be like Uzzah, who's gotten very commonplace with God and commonplace with that which is sacred. Have you, though, become very familiar with God? Or perhaps like David. How about David? On this occasion, you wanted God's presence, but when you got a glimpse of his absolute holiness, you drew back and weren't so sure you wanted to be that close to God. Or like Michael. Oh, Michael. Maybe you're jealous of God. You're jealous of God getting all the attention. Could you be a spectator who doesn't believe in getting too enthusiastic about worship? Or maybe Ovet Edom. Do you welcome the presence of the living God into your home and life, resulting in great blessing to you and to all your household? Do you gather with brothers and sisters expecting to meet with God and to experience his presence? Here, I'm going to wrap this up. Here at the Star in the East, everything, if you haven't figured that out yet, is about Yeshua. There's all kinds of Messianic expressions out there. But as for me in this house, it's about Yeshua. Everything is, pred if we don't have Yeshua, and we don't correctly identify and live for him, we have nothing. We have nothing. You might feel good about some, you know, some philosophies of life you can find in some congregation. You can find some sort of ritual if you're looking for that. Some sort of moral code if you're looking for that. We're about Yeshua. Let me get that clear to you. At the Star in the East, everything here is about Yeshua. So everything must therefore begin with the worship of Yeshua. Let me share with you a very interesting point. Do you know, you know what the first reference in the apostolic writings to worship is? The first use of the word proskuneo, the Greek word proskuneo for worship. Do you know where that is? Anybody? It's in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2 particularly, verse 2. Here's the context. Here's the verse. I'll read it for you. And when the newborn king of the Jews, where, I should say, where is the newborn king of the Jews? Where is he? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. That's the first reference of worship in the apostolic writings. 
True corporate worship should be a reverent response, as I said, to God's presence. God, he's met us here. (laughs) In return, I hope he will be met with the praise from here on out that he deserves. Please rise. Hallelujah. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, I know one thing for sure, Lord. Most people got here today in a car. And they got in here in a car because they prepared to be here. How did they prepare, Lord? They put gas in their car. They put gas in the car. If they didn't have gas in the car, they couldn't be here, Lord. Couldn't get here. Unless they got a bus. Or they walked, most likely. They would put gas in the car so they can drive. Father, in Yeshua's name. In Yeshua's name, Father, your Holy Spirit fuels our presence here, Father. We have come here to be filled with your Holy Spirit, to be filled in your holy presence. Father, you have gifted us with revelation and knowledge. Your word says to pray for those things, and knowledge and revelation has gone forth. But what good is a car if we don't start it and move it? We can have a full tank, Lord, but we're not going anywhere. Father, if you're going to fuel our beings, Father, prompt us to move on what you fueled us with. Father, we've come to be in the holy presence, in your holy presence. We've come to worship you. You've met us here. I pray, Father, that we treat every opportunity to be in your presence as sacred, that we treat it with preparation, that we learn the lessons for those who had the presence of the ark and, Father, responded in various ways. But the witness of Ovet Edom is the most prolific for us, Father, that he embraced any opportunity to have your presence in his home. And he put you at the center of his life and home, and he celebrated and rejoiced in the presence of Almighty God. Meet us here, Father. You have honored that prayer. But, Father, have we met you with our praise is the challenge. And I pray in Yeshua's name that, Lord, your Holy Spirit begins to really move in our hearts and minds about the degree of preparation that we have put into being in your presence. What are we showing you in our spirits? What are we showing you in our appearance? What are we showing you in our response while we're here? What are we showing you as to our love and passion and desire to be in your company? How much we truly revere and desire you for our lives, how important and significant you are in our lives. I guess, Father, I guess it's just between each of us in your Ruach HaKodesh. I know, Lord, that you met us here, and our tanks are full. Father, it's time for us to get started. B'Shem Yeshua in the congregation says, Yivarech Yahweh Vaish Marecha Sadonai Panavalecha Vichanecha Sadonai Panavalecha Visim Lecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, to be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord would lift his countenance upon you and that he would grant you his shalom. Praise him. Praise him. B'Shem Yeshua Adonai, we praise you. Amen and amen. Amen.